Precious Greens, it's Michael O'Neill, and welcome to this road edition of How Greens Can Get Things Done. I am speaking to you from my ancestral home of Ohio. I was in town for a wedding this weekend, as I mentioned last week, and so I do not have a live show for you today, but I've uploaded this video to talk to you about uh, some speaking tips that I think were just wonderfully demonstrated by Seth Capperdale at the Green Party annual national meeting this past summer. Seth's speech uh, during the annual national meeting uh, was a highlight for me in one of the most memorable aspects of that annual meeting. And the reason for that is because Seth, who is running for governor of New Jersey as a Green, demonstrated some just uh, fantastic use of rhetoric, specifically repetition, that I think a lot of green candidates and green spokespeople and leaders could learn a lot from. And it's no accident that Seth's background is as a liberation theology minister, as a pastor. And in the tradition of pastors and preachers and priests, uh, there is just a, a wealth of knowledge there about how to give a passionate speech that moves people, but also communicates a real message. And Seth demonstrates that it's not a matter of style versus substance. We're used to, in mainstream politics, style being used to camouflage a lack of substance, or even worse, to mask a vile and divisive and oppressive policy. But Seth shows through his repetition of the theme, the last shall be first, that through that repetition, he uses it to summarize a political framework, a policy framework and an ideological vision, but also uses it to make his speech much more memorable and to make it motivating and inspiring to people. So I have uh, packaged here a clip from his speech from the annual national meeting, and that was originally broadcast on the Jill Stein Facebook page as part of the Green News Network. I had the honor of shooting that, and so any bad camera work is squarely on my shoulders. And I'm also in get, going to include in this post a link to some public speaking tips that talks about the use of repetition in, in different ways. And I would love to talk to Seth uh, in the future and you know, other you know, Greens who come from professional speaking backgrounds to talk about what Green candidates can do to spice up their speeches and to make our important policies um, more memorable, um, more easily understood and motivating to our audiences. And I think that these are learnable skills and they're teachable skills. I think the reason that so many of America's greatest and most beloved orders came out of religious traditions, because those are traditions where people are taught to speak passionately and taught to speak in a way that motivates people. And it's not just that, you know, only naturally charismatic, great public speakers go into those traditions, although I'm sure that skill helps, but there's a, there's a framework there for how to give a sermon, how to, to give a speech. And there are tips and tricks within those traditions that are easily and freely accessible through the internet in terms of templates and techniques and themes that we can draw from as we are trying to use our words to make the world a better place. And I do just want to note that while it's clear that Seth is drawing on his background as a pastor, he's, his speech is not obviously a sermon. He's not doing a, a caricature of a, a sermon or a preacher, but he's very um, judiciously and selectively using certain rhetorical devices that really amplify his message. So I encourage you to watch that speech and also check out the link that I've provided here. 
Uh, this is a road edition of how Greens can get things done, but I'm looking forward to speaking to you live next Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, as I do most weeks. And I'm Michael O'Neill, your friendly Green Party of New York staff organizer. You can always contact me at michael at gpny.org, or you can leave a question or comment on this video. I have edited our backlog of videos so that they are ready for YouTube. And once I get to a place with faster upload speeds, I will start loading those into a playlist so that these episodes will be more easily discoverable and viewer viewable. All right. So enjoy the clip and have a great rest of your Sunday. And thanks for watching How Greens Can Get Things Done. I actually have a title for this keynote. I, I had a chance last night to do a, a lengthy town hall. And, and thank you to many of you who came out and spent an hour and a half listening to me with, with no notes. So today I actually wrote a keynote um, because I wanted to focus on a particular way on something that I felt is a national message. The title is The Administrative Skills, the Policy Awareness, the Creativity, and the Morals to Run a Government. Greens, you've got thousands of potential candidates. Up until I decided to run for governor and receive the blessing of the Green Council back in October last year, I have had one identity, Pastor Seth Copperdale. I'm a pastor because I became steeped in liberation theology. I never would have become a pastor if I hadn't discovered liberation theology in college. So. <laughs> liberation theology is, is that faith isn't about pie in the sky after we die. Faith is about transformation about all things on earth as they are in heaven. So that prayer that we say on earth as it is in heaven, it's about this earth and changing this earth. That's what faith is about. Those who are grounded in liberation theology believe that the last are first. And that means, for one, that those who are last should be our first concern in terms of prioritizing resources and attention. But it means much more than that. It means that the last and those who are deeply committed to living among the last in righteous struggles for justice and for beauty shall become first in terms of leadership. Let me say that again. Those who have been last, and those whose moral convictions put them square in the middle of righteous struggles, square in the middle of marginalized communities, and right in the middle of the issues of a dying planet, they are most prepared to lead. With that as the way of seeing the world, my congregation has gone from almost closing its doors 16 years ago with 35 people left in the building to being a church of 500. We've gone from being a church that was all white, except for one black guy married to a white woman, to being a church with 55 um, countries represented through first generation immigrants, as well as incredible diversity from those who've been in this country for hundreds of years. We have 3,500 people in our building each week for programs that make the world more beautiful. And to us, anything that makes the world more beautiful and more just is ministry. So whether that's AA every day or deaf and hard of hearing societies or capoeira or any other kind of dance school or um, worship services in Chinese and Indonesian and Jewish services on Saturdays and Buddhist services on Thursdays, it all belongs in our, in our church. Our little congregation has, quite frankly, changed our town and impacted our region in very, very positive ways. And each day of my 16 years in ministry has been about committing to and empowering those who are beaten down, those who are mourning, and those who are prevented from inheriting the earth. I believe that being a religious leader is a career that has tremendous potential to affect change in local society. That's why I became a minister. And I actually offer this partly out loud as a challenge to Greens. I think that the faith communities around this country are, in org there are organizations that need to be claimed by the Greens. That if the diversity that we need is going to come about. <laughs> the Christian right has destroyed the, the, the perception of what it means to be grounded in justice. We can take back the faith communities. A central mandate to the calling that I've taken on is to embody the practice of loving your neighbor as yourself. And if you really commit to that and commit to listening to your neighbors, the local ones, you'll have a lifetime of meaningful work to do. 
If you really listen to your neighbors and connect the dots between your neighbors and the issues that plague the world, you'll find yourself caring not only about your local neighbors, but about the global injustices, and you'll be led to engage. During my, doing my job well has been about listening and learning. It's been about jumping into deep waters on the side of love and justice with fear and trepidation. It's been about taking risks for the sake of love. I've been marrying gay couples for 10 years before the state ever said it was okay that I do it. The last should be first. We added solar panels to the church roof and focused on greening our property before going green was cool. The earth is last, so it shall be first. It's been about responding to the immigration insanity in this country, the racial and ethnic cleansing masquerading as immigration policy, by writing bills as a congregation to protect ethnic minorities and working those bills through the U.S. House and Senate, the last are first. Yes. Doing my job well has been about leading immigration rally after immigration rally. It's been about moving people into our building for 11 months when they were put on ankle monitors and told they had to leave on a certain day. We said, just move in on that day instead. It's been about pounding on the door of ICE in Washington until they actually let those nine people who stayed in for 11 months stay in this country. The last are first. Doing my job well has been not only to learn about mass incarceration, but to respond to that narrative by building houses for people coming out of jail. The last are first. To do my job well has been to not only despair about the lack of resources for folks re-entering society, but about building neighbor core re-entry services. The last are first. To do it well is not only despairing about the lack of Medicaid dollars for mental health services for the poor, but building a no-fee mental health clinic for the poor in central New Jersey. The last are first. To, to do my job well is not only despair about the Iraq war, but to build housing for homeless veterans whose lives are forever changed by what they've seen and done. The last are first. Not only to do my job well is to not only despair about the lack of clarity about finishing the, the recovery after Hurricane Sandy, Sandy, but building a nonprofit for long-term recovery that's organized around volunteerism, and we've completed 200 homes now. The last are first. Yeah. To do my job well has been to not only despair about the global refugee crisis, but get ourselves approved as a refugee resettlement site by the State Department so we could start bringing refugees straight to our town. And we've resettled 24 refugees since Donald Trump became president of this country. So these are some of the works that I've, I've created and I've encouraged in my congregation and its web of nonprofits. Responses for and by and with the people who are last. And here are three things that I've learned in the process. One, I've, I've grown into being an administrator. I didn't have those skills at the beginning, but getting down and dirty in this work, you learn how to administrate or you give up and you give it to someone else who could do it better. But I've learned about myself that I can administrate things. Secondly, I've learned that victims of the world's abuses also can administrate things and also can shape policies because the very best times that I've been successful with any of these things that I've started have been when I've come side by side with somebody who's actually been the last and I've recognized that the last are more first than those who come alongside the last. Right? They're the first. I can't tell you how often it is that we get someone out of detention who's been sitting 18 months in a for-profit hellhole in Elizabeth Detention Center, and within three weeks, they've finally got a place to sleep, and they've got food, and now they're the ones going back inside that detention center to speak French with other French speakers from Burkina Faso. It's unbelievable to see how quickly the last, when they're given the resources, they don't stay last for long. They become the new first who serve the new last that we recognize and there's always a new last until justice and peace embrace. And thirdly, by being a pastor and community organizer who connects with real suffering people and with a network of organizations that work with victims of the world's abuses, I have become angry. I have become exceedingly angry. I'm angry at the leeches at the top who rob the commons and take away beauty. I'm angry about the neoliberal agenda. I'm angry about the privatization of everything, sickened by the greed that drives our system. I'm disgusted with the upper middle class who prop up the system year after year by voting to continue the mediocrity. 
I'm angry and disgusted, but I also know how it happens that people buy the lie. For I myself am a new green. Pastor, I got to do some confessional here too. I have most of my life pulled the lever for the lesser of two evils, never believing until recently that there's a different political possibility. Most of the work that I've done has been way downstream. Most of the work I've done is to lift people up after they've been thrashed in the brutal streams of destruction that flow from top-down oligarchs that run this banana republic that's masquerading as a democracy. I have been very happy serving as a social justice pastor, but I cannot do that any longer without also challenging the political systems directly by running for office. I'm tired of only throwing stones at tanks. I will keep throwing stones at tanks, but I now want to climb into those tanks and beat them into plowshares and pruning hooks. Garden tools for a new day. And then I want to cut the funds. I want to cut the funds for all future weapons of any kind of warring madness. So why did I just tell all of you the Green Party National Convention about me and about myself? Why didn't I just sit here and rattle off my specific green policies and unpack the pillars? Well, I didn't do that because here this morning I'm in front of the choir. This choir knows the issues, and in fact, you've spent the past day and a half going deeper into your own thoughts and, and taking the issues even further. But what I think I can offer to you today is this. The Republicans and Democratic machines know where to find their candidates. They know how to groom them to fit the needs of the wealthy few. They know whose pockets need to be lined along the way. They know the types of career paths and the necessary connections that legitimize someone as being worthy to hold high office. Governor, senator, house. They know who, is, who to groom and how to groom them so that they can masquerade as candidates for the people. But these parties know where to find their candidates and how to mold them. They know it well. And so must we. We need to get to that space. I believe that the Green Party has the potential to dominate politics in America in this age if we begin to look for our candidates among those who are steeped in communities as leaders of nonprofits, social action groups, public education, public health organizations, environmental organizations, and religious communities. Our ranks are filled with people who know how to run things, who know the issues that create poverty and hurt, have dreamt up solutions and have collaborated with others to pull things off with limited funds. Our ranks are filled with people who are not tied to the corporatocracy, who are not self-seeking and hoping to get rich, people who break the stranglehold but, um, by who they are and by who they are not. Our ranks in the nonprofit and faith-driven world are incredibly diverse. There's no reason on earth why the Green Party in America shouldn't be the blackest, brownest, most Native American party in America. For these, for these are the, I got one minute. <laughs> for these are the people who are leading the ad advocacy fight for justice and peace and who run the churches and mosques and nonprofits in the most underserved communities all around America. Our ranks are filled with people who are angry and hopeful, people who haven't given up but who are instead digging in. So what can I offer you this year? First, I can offer myself, a green governor working in Trenton on behalf of the people of New Jersey, modeling something for the country. And what else? I can offer to you the constant reminder that you, in the work you already do, as organizers and as workers in the helping professions, are in the presence each and every day of potential candidates for office. In fact, the next candidate may be you. Thanks so much. Woo!